this is Lindsay, host of The Corner Table. I am taking a break from the studio for the month of July. While I'm gone, we're going to be playing some of our favorite episodes from the past year. I will be back in August with some brand new episodes. And until then, have a great summer. Welcome to The Corner Table, a podcast about food and drink in Madison, produced by the Capital Times. I'm your host, Lindsay Christians, food writer for the Cap Times, and today we're going to be talking about acoustics in restaurants, what makes them loud, what makes them not so loud, and just other trends in design with Jake Morrison, who is an architect and a designer who's done some of Madison's flagship, most wonderful, exciting new restaurants in the past few years. So I'm very excited to introduce Jake, who's in the studio today. Hi, Jake. Hi there. <laughs> Thank you for it's being nice here. nice to be here. So I, I asked you to come into the podcasting room of, of excitement here uh, because I have been it's noticing... It's really nice. <laughs> it's very nice. Um, I've been noticing that I'm, I'm hearing more and more about uh, acoustics in restaurants. And so I decided to look and see, you know, some of the newer restaurants that are built, like who's responsible for the acoustics in those. And it turns out that sometimes it's you. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your background in uh, architecture and design and kind of where you got started with, with uh, designing some of these restaurants. In Madison. Uh, so my background is I was educated in Savannah, Georgia. I'm originally from the South in Louisiana and Georgia, so I, I kind of grew up in the, the Gothic South, as it were. Um, but shortly after I graduated from college, I moved to New York and spent the majority of my career working there until we came here. So I worked for a couple of well-known architects uh, who specialized in um, kind of stylistic architecture. And then when we moved here in 2009, um, I designed a, a number of different kinds of things, houses, additions, offices, things like that. And then uh, in 2012, I was approached by uh, Dan Fox to do Heritage Tavern. And I was lucky enough to have been selected and follow through with that. And it was the first restaurant in Madison that I did. And that kind of opened the door through word of mouth and association to do the the slew of other restaurants that I was lucky enough to get to work on after that. And so after that, you did Sujo, right? After that, yeah, I worked with uh, Tori Miller and his uh, partners to do Sujo. Shortly after that, right on the heels of that, we did Estrion on uh, West Johnson Street. After that was a couple of smaller ones, very different kind of approach to design, but really fun, Morse Ramen on King Street, and right next door to it, Shinji Morimoto's sort of reboot of his original Morimoto Kushi uh, restaurant that he yeah. got started with in Madison. And uh, then after that, or kind of simultaneously with that, might have been a little bit before actually, was I worked with Chad Vogel to do Robin Room, and uh, working with Chad again on another project, and also doing some work at the Madison Club. Oh, to, cool to kind of revamp some of their spaces. So Robin Room is that uh, craft cocktail bar on East Johnson. We had Mike Liu in the, yeah, I in heard the that. podcasting room a few weeks ago. So, um, But so your first kind of major restaurant project here in Madison, you said it was Heritage Tavern. Right. Um, so that's a pretty live space in terms of acoustically. Like yeah. w- what were some of the challenges, you know, when you were looking at, you know, just sort of how to, how to manage the sound in that space? That's an interesting space. It's kind of in the basement, right? And it has this heritage of being, besides Heritage Tavern, <laughs> uh, Momart. And it had the, this these two rooms separated by this giant brick wall. And from the beginning, they wanted a bar on one side and dining room on the other side. So the first approach is like, okay, well, you know, bars sound different than dining rooms. If you're sitting at a table with a bunch of people eating dinner, you want to be able to hear everybody. But if you're a bar, you want it to be a little bit lively and, and have some action. So the first step was sort of defining what kind of spaces these were. And it's not just the acoustics. It's the surfaces and the colors of the place. Um, the bar is open to the kitchen in that one. Um, and then the, the bigger picture was that this is a restaurant and bar in an apartment building with apartments directly on top of it mm-hmm. that we – and in that case, it was – the main thing was that the owners of the building didn't want 
the people who rented apartments and paid good money for these apartments to be disturbed by a, an active bar and dining room downstairs. So Cafe Momar obviously had been there, you know, it was a long time kind of restaurant and club. I remember they had like ham and organ nights. <laughs> so I'm wondering, uh, there there was a fire in that space. Yeah. Was, were any of the acoustic, you know, the things that they had maybe done for Momar, were any of those still there? There was nothing there. Oh my the gosh. Was so completely got it. So when it was Momar, if you lived there, it was noisy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It definitely, it, every single part, every stick and splinter inside that space, other than the brick, was ruined. The, all the water from them putting out the fire, the wood floors were in waves, uh, which means you can come back in and start from scratch, you know? And so it's kind of like this refreshing thing to just say, what, here's the box. Let's come in and put this box in. In that case, we, we ended up doing a special ceiling system uh, over the bar to keep the noise from the bar from bleeding into the, the spaces around it. But that kind of acoustics doesn't actually deaden the sound within the space. So Heritage is a little bit more lively, you know, than some of the other restaurants I've done. Is Sujo similar? Sujo was a new construction as well. Sujo was new construction. It was a brand new building. Also apartments above. Apartments above. In that case, there are um, commercial spaces right Offices, above it. Yeah. yeah. Which is a little bit different, but still, yeah, you don't want people getting bothered by it. At least there, like that night, the restaurant's more active and the offices are more likely to be closed. Hopefully you're not at the dentist at like 8 p.m. <laughs> yeah, hopefully not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's bad news if you are. <laughs> Things are going wrong for you. And in that case, um, we did put some acoustics in. In that case, it was over the bar. And in that one, you kind of have the classic restaurant thing where you have a big tall space. And we've only put a ceiling over the dining room. And then you have exposed air conditioning ducts and sprinkler heads that all just get painted black so that it kind of disappears into this, you know, vague space above you. And so in that one, we put black acoustic panels on the ceiling because it's really easy. You don't see them. They do some really good work to absorb sound. Um, And then you can have a bit more designy stuff up front where you want people to see it from the street and, you know, be pulled into it. And in that one, we also have the noodle bar. And that was always meant to be Almost like you just walked into a thing on the street. You know, it's a really happening, very active, that's really loud from the kitchen. The the chefs in the kitchen actually have half their ingredients up on the counter. So you're right there in the middle of it. And in that room, it's always meant to be loud. So we didn't really have to worry about acoustics in that one. Estrion is quite quiet. Estrion's very quiet. In that case, we actually hired an acoustic consultant from the beginning to give us technical guidance materials to use, where best to use them, things to avoid. Because the things that can affect the the acoustic profile of a place, the surfaces, are they all glass and concrete? Are the number of people in a space, the more people you have in it, the louder it gets? Is the kitchen open to it? How much noise is the stereo putting out, the air conditioning? And if a place starts to get too loud, then people have to start talking louder to be heard and then you're putting more noise into it. And so you you pass a tipping point that it becomes cacophonous. So there we got these really great acoustic fabric panels. And we're able to very carefully design them into the ceiling so they're almost invisible. And if you look up at the ceiling at Estran, you can see these little seams about every four feet where these acoustic panels meet each other. But there's these beams in the ceiling that break it up. So it doesn't look like you're sitting in an office or a bank or something. You never pick that up. But you can sit at a table with eight people, and you can hear all of them talk, and you don't hear the conversation of the table next to you. That's fascinating. Bouncing back around. So, so the in that case, it's really you know kind of how the space sounds and how live it is really affects not only like you know having something on the wall or something on the ceiling to kind of absorb sound or reflect sound or whatever you want to do with it it's also affecting like the design of the space and like the construction of it too right yeah it's really got to be integrated into it you have to go into it with a clear idea of how you can integrate acoustics into it without compromising the look you want to achieve and some you know everything is a trade off sometimes you have to compromise a little bit on the look to get a better acoustic thing sometimes you, have to, you sacrifice a little acoustics to get a better look it's you know, everything is a trade-off. And, and there, it just worked really well. It just everything kind of clicked in place. At different restaurants also, you know, they want different liveliness. At Estrion, they, they have a crowd that is coming from the Overture Center who have often just heard a really great concert, and they don't want to 
come into a place that they can't hear each other suddenly. So they're, you know, they're working with the crowd they know they want to get and um, accommodate. And I think people then go there knowing that, oh, I can go to a place I can just hear everybody talk. So I'm curious, just, you know, from your perspective as a designer, how do you think how loud a place is or sort of, you know, that that kind of auditory experience? How do you think it it affects your experience of the food? Like, do you think that they inform one another? Like, I definitely do, because you're creating an environment of a bunch of different factors. Like I said, there's the way the place looks. There's the way the place smells, um, the way the, the music that's playing, what that is. And then the acoustics of a place. Can you hear the person you're talking to? These all, all these different moving parts that come together to create a very complex atmosphere that hopefully is really nice and makes you want to come back. Um, the design of a place, you know, it will draw people back to a place. And the design of a place can in some ways determine how much you can charge people for food and the quality of the food. Nobody's going to pay a lot of money if the place feels like a cafeteria at the school, right? You still have to do good food. You still have to have a good atmosphere, but you have to at least have a starting point. I feel like I notice lighting in places, for example, when it's not Lighting's working. A big, big deal. Yeah. yeah. Like if it's if it's too harsh or if it seems like it's just something, something is fighting with something else. Yeah. You know? and, and I'll notice it if it's not quite right, but otherwise it's invisible. And I don't necessarily know. A lot of people pick up on not just lighting, but a lot of things, design moves, if they're not right. If they're incongruous and they are fighting with each other, people will pick that up and they're not going to say, oh, this this doesn't feel right because of the form of this thing and the shape of that thing and the color of this other thing. They just know it doesn't feel right. And we're all kind of built in with these radars of what works and what doesn't work. Sometimes things that are very kind of different, work really well together. It's just like in food. Sometimes that is the thing you need. It's really hard to do that, but it's really successful when it works. Do you find that sometimes uh, your, your, your design needs to not, like it needs to in some ways take a back seat to the food? Like, I, I mean, not a back seat. It needs to be complimentary, right? It needs to oh, not yeah. distract. Yeah, I definitely feel like the design should not be the star of the show. <laughs> <laughs> it's... People are going to a restaurant to have nice food, you know, especially if they're going to a nice restaurant they can pay a lot of money for. They, that's a big part of it. I want the place to look, with all the restaurants I work on, I want them to be really beautiful but not distracting. And there's a range of how you can achieve that. For instance, at the Robin Room, I think it's a much more kind of dynamic space that is sort of like, you know, um, noticeable. But it's a bar. It's a really lively bar. It's in this cool neighborhood. It, it really works. A place like Estrion or Heritage Tavern um, need to have a really good atmosphere that kind of fades into the background but never goes away. So that you always feel like you're ensconced in a really nice chair in a library or something. And that feeling is just all around you without you having to to constantly pay attention to it or being pushed into your face. So you were working uh, recently kind of simultaneously on like Morris Ramen and Muramoto. Yeah. Um, and those spaces had their own kind of specific challenges because of like the history of them, right? Right. So you're not coming in from scratch like you were with yeah. some of the others. Yeah. And Morimoto and, uh, and next door, Morris Ramen, we had to deal with a lot of existing things. And the budgets were not quite as big as Estrion, let's say. But that's great because you can still do really good stuff with smaller budgets. It it's, doesn't limit the quality of the design. It just limits how you have to do it. And in both those cases, we had existing kitchens. We're not going to move the kitchen. You know, it's like <laughs> ridiculous expense for no real gain. Um, so the real trick was going through each of those spaces and figuring out what doesn't work. And what are the things we need to achieve to make this restaurant better? And in every restaurant, you you're often driven by the chef slash owner who has a clear idea of what kind of restaurant they want it to be. And because they know their food and they know their clientele, they are more clued into what that needs to be than anybody else. And so my job is often translating vague ideas of what they want into real stuff. So they say they want it to be cozy and quiet and and very intimate. Well, I have to turn the word intimate into wood and, you know, concrete and uh, upholstered cushions and things. Um, At Morris Ramen, you know, they're going for sort of an elevated street food. Um, So you want it to be uh, kind of cozy in the tradition of a Japanese restaurant, which Japanese restaurants are not big open places. 
they're often behind walls and you have to kind of sneak into them, which I think is really great. It's like you're discovering a treasure. So at Morris Robin, they have these great banners in the window that Shinji set up from Japan. So it's really hard. You can't see in, but you go in and then you also have this layer of all the things that came before. Sushi Red, uh, Shinji's uh, uh, barbecue haze, and before that, his original restaurant. Before that, I was told it was a hot dog place. So you have, you know, six, seven layers of things you have to deal with. And in that case, you're not going to change the air conditioning. The lighting can be changed a little bit. At Morris Ramen, we needed to dampen down the acoustics. And if you're familiar with the space, there's these, this wall and ceiling of these integrated Japanese-inspired uh, panels with these slats on them. And behind those slats is acoustic foam. So you have acoustic foam all along that back wall and all along the ceiling of where you sit. And you can't see that, right? You can't see it because it's black acoustic foam. And uh, they kind of look like Japanese speaker grills. <laughs> kind of. So, But it's a restaurant that has an open kitchen with a very loud hood. Um, but that's okay because, like I said, it's elevated street food. You want some action. But we needed something to tamp down the noise. So when you're sitting at a table with somebody and you're by the – the stove, you can still hear each other talk. And you're not expecting to have quiet, intimate conversation, but you can at least talk without having to strain yourself. So you're, you're shooting for like a real tight range of what you want. What are some of the challenges when you're working with like a hypothetical group of people that have really different ideas? Like, you know, is that is it a good thing because you end up with something that like everybody likes? Is it a bad thing? I mean... it's If you get people who uh, are just trying to please the most people... It's difficult. Uh, what, what you end up with, my old boss in New York used to say, is if you work with a lot of people in a committee, you end up with hot dogs. Nobody hates hot dogs. Hot dogs are perfectly good. Sometimes they're great, but nobody loves hot dogs. So you get this thing that's good. It's not great, though. And so you end up kind of compromising because nobody can sit down and really provide a, a vision that sometimes takes a little bit of courage. Do you um, do you like sort of being coming into something and saying, okay, I am opening a poke restaurant, a mac and cheese restaurant. I'm going to be opening a it's about time. whatever. Yeah, all right. Um, I'm going to be opening this restaurant, and here are my parameters. Or is there a project that you would just like to dream from the ground up? Like, do you have like a, a restaurant in mind that you would love to design? I've got a couple in mind that I'd love to design. Yeah, what are they? <laughs> what are they? I would love one day to have. A restaurant in in the countryside near Madison, between Milwaukee and Madison and Chicago, that people come to and stay at a, a beautiful inn and come for this beautiful restaurant. The um, you know the Stone Barns in New York is a great example. Of this place that people will travel to to go to because it's so extraordinary, and to get to design something like that would be amazing. I don't know if it'll that kind of thing ever happens, but one always dreams and one always has to have oh, ideas. Oh, I bet. I feel like the, there's groundwork there that exists. Yeah, you know, the farm tourism, ecotourism, um, it kind of all works in there. But I don't run restaurants, and I have great respect for the people who do because it's so difficult to do. And uh, I never presume to just say, oh, why don't you just, like, open this kind of restaurant? Because I don't know. No, for sure. Is, yeah. But is there something else that you'd like to see, like, in Madison too? Right now I'm working on the Madison Club, and it's a, it's an amazing project because it's – Historical and yeah. How old is that building? That's got to be uh, 1917. Oh yeah. And uh, it's a years. great building that again has some mistakes that need to be fixed. But there's a, such a great opportunity to make it a different place, yet more true to itself at the same time. And I'm always looking to do projects like that. You know, ha- having done all of these projects, are there things that you've learned that you don't want to have to do again? Every every project is so different, um, and some projects offer more opportunity than others do. I don't want to do a project where somebody just needs the kitchen and the bathrooms done. I'm not interested in that. And I have enough work, fortunately, that I don't need to. Though if things slowed down, you know, that'd be fine too. I really am lucky to have worked with a lot of people who are specifically now coming and saying, you've done good work. I want you to express this vision. And that's, that's as much as any architect can ask for. Um, So if somebody comes to me and they say that I have all these parameters for a job, that's fine. If they're then willing to to work with me. And then there's the technical parts of a job, too, that have to be explained to them that, you know, people who don't deal with these things don't know about lighting. Yeah, for sure. Acoustics is one of them, you know, and so they need advice on it. 
Um, so there's the technical part. There's the more abstract, esoteric art part of it. And food and restaurants in particular are things where a lot of kind of indistinct things come together to create a good atmosphere. And it's always hard to define exactly what those pieces are. But you know it when it works. And you know it when it doesn't work. Well, thank you so much for coming in and for talking about Yeah, thanks so much for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Thanks. This has been an archival episode of The Corner Table. Editing help is offered by Eric Lawrenson, and our music was composed by Patrick Christians. Subscribe to The Corner Table wherever you get your podcasts, and find ongoing food and drink news at captimes.com. We'll be back with more episodes in August, and until then, have a great summer. Thank you.